So uh, it's always dangerous trying to come up with pithy titles for things. <laughs> Why the University Needs a Church is not too bad a title for what I want to talk about here. <clears throat> I, 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 what I want to focus attention on is the uh, The dilemma that we have in the modern university uh, because of the assumption that th the university should be guided by something we call public reason or secular reason or uh, the assumption that, that reason's proper functioning uh, necessarily has to marginalize or bracket questions of theology or questions of belief. That, uh, that re reason has to be theologically neutral. And <clears throat> a lot of this, th this talk and, and, the, and the final talk, I'm going to be looking at the, uh, why do we assume that and, and why that's an assumption Christians really should not endorse at all, <clears throat> ever. <laughs> okay. uh, and that um, part, of the, part of the problem I think we've had uh, in the last, I don't know, century Part of the problem that Christians have now in the academy is they're trying to figure out how to navigate uh, their careers and their work and play by the rules, uh, play, play nice with others by the rules. But um, I'm not sure that a lot of people realize how uh, not just unfair the rules are, that is, these are rules that, uh, that prevent us from doing what reason actually requires us to do, uh, but, but how, um, how biased the rules are. Um, the, the idea that, uh, that public reason or uh, the idea that what goes on in higher education has to bracket theology is not a theologically neutral assumption. The, what we believe about the nature of reason is not theologically neutral. There is no theologically neutral understanding of reason. Uh, and, and the fact that a lot of Christians kind of think there is and trying to figure out how to, how to honor it properly, uh, I think the sooner we realize that that's, that, that was an invented idea that, that, uh, that was invented in part precisely to marginalize and to, to render uh, inert uh, Christian claims, to, to, to displace God, that, that, was, that this is not a, uh, and in fact, uh, that, the, that the interests of reason are not served when reason is cut off from ultimate realities. Uh, that would be another way of putting it. So I'm going to be dancing around this idea in many ways uh, th the rest of the day and the rest of my life. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I want to, as by way of transition, I left out the uh, last section of this last talk, and it actually it works well as a transition. Again, uh, um, my... Uh, my friend Stanley Hauerwas, uh, another essay of his uh, in that collection uh, called The State, the, I think it's called The State of the University. Uh, it's a collection of essays on education. And uh, in one of the essays in there, he talks about facing up to the fact that many young people do abandon their faith while they're in college, that they, something happens to them when they're in universities that causes them to abandon their faith. Uh, and um, and ha this has been happening for some time. Uh, and Hauerwas says, it, it's a mistake not to take seriously that what many learned or thought they were learning in colleges and universities led them to abandon Christianity. And then he offers a short explanation. The students took course after course in which there was no discernible connection to Christian claims about the way things are. That surely created the conditions that made the conclusion that Christianity is at best irrelevant and at worst false, hard to avoid. In other words, I suspect many people who leave their Christianity behind after they've gone to college do so because, and this is a very interesting point, they have been created by God to desire the truth. It's a very Augustinian idea, and not just Augustine. We've been created by God to desire the truth. I would argue the reason we have reason is to know God. Um, we're created with that desire, and yet, in modern universities, Hauerwas points out, 
the kind of knowledge they are given and the kind of configuration within which knowledge is conveyed to them makes it impossible for them to think that what Christians believe could be true. Now, if you want truth, God's created you to want truth and given the evidence, I'm not gonna find it in Christianity. Uh, at best, he writes, they assume the church may be important for spiritual and moral issues, but those spheres of life are not assumed to be about truth. Again, Howard was here echoing what Dallas Willard said earlier. Now, he goes on to say, the strategy of many Christian colleges and universities, both Catholic and Protestant, unfortunately served to underwrite the presumption that the Christian part of education did not have to do with truth. What made a school Christian was not the content of the courses, but a concern for the whole student. Student life, therefore, became the locus of any expression of Christianity. And he says this is the case in a lot of, and he's not, he's not speaking of any particular group of Christian schools. I mean, he could have, uh, you know, theologically liberal or nominal uh, schools in mind. But I, I have to say, I see this sometimes even with, uh, again, theologically conservative schools, where the difference that Christianity makes to, to, to knowledge is not reflected as strongly uh, in the curriculum. Uh, Christianity makes a difference in terms of student life. So the moral life and, uh, uh, but within the classroom, it's, it's not as, as decisive. The relegation of strong religious beliefs to the personal side of life in modern universities reflected the distinction between the private and the public imposed on the church by liberal political regimes. Christian theologians aided this development by underwriting what Douglas Sloan identifies as a two realms theory of truth. Such a view distinguished the truths of science, which was thought to be objective and impersonal, from the truths of faith, which are called subjective, uh, grounded as they are in feelings or convention. Uh, now this may be a implausible claim to you that Christian schools don't promote Christian learning, but uh, and I'm not saying they, they don't at all, but I think uh, that, that, that most people teaching at Christian colleges and universities got PhDs from secular research universities, which means, say, if you're a historian, uh, you've been exposed to methods, of, uh, methods and agendas of studying history that haven't been informed by a rich theological uh, set of ideas. Uh, the, and so, you, you, in fact, you've, you've gotten, you got through your dissertation defense largely by avoiding any kind of distinctively Christian thinking. And maybe you're trying to get a job at a secular university, and so you, you again, you don't want to, you can't fly the colors. You can't be thoroughly Christian, fully Christian as a scholar, uh, and, and see the kind of difference that Christian ideas make. Uh, in, in your scholarship. So I think a lot of Christians do adopt a kind of secularized uh, notion of scholarship just to kind of fly under the radar and to be safe. Uh, I, I can understand that for practical reasons. I'm not condemning anyone for doing it to feed their children. Uh, I don't want their children to starve. Um, but I do think that uh, it's also done because of the fact that I don't think, uh, I don't think a lot of Christians are entirely confident that the invention of what we call secular reason uh, is, uh, is a relatively recent and, and, and very problematic, uh, problematic invention. So uh, let's get my iPad to behave here. Duke University in my part of the country uh, has as its motto, eruditio et religio, erudition and religion. And a few years ago, they inaugurated a new president who took the occasion of her inaugural address to speak about the motto which she admitted left her immediately uneasy when she learned about it after having taken the job. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> you're running this ship 
Here's what we're guided by. Well, it's a motto, it's just a, it's a sales slogan. I mean, but she was made uneasy by it. The motto she said in her address, <laughs> the motto had a, has an archaic sound if one provides a literal translation, erudition and religion. That's why it's best to keep these things in Latin. So people, <laughs> it's like the fine print in the user's agreement for the software. Nobody's ever gonna read it. <clears throat> But it wasn't just the archaic vocabulary that made her uneasy. She confessed, it seems hard to square with the restless yearning for discovery, the staunch and fearless commitment to seek for truth wherever truth may be found that is the hallmark of a great university. Religion will stifle erudition. It's a dangerous thing. Now, one could snarkily observe that in settings, in institutions that are led by people with these sorts of uh, concerns, uh, in fact, uh, it's very difficult to, to yearn for discovery that involves theological insight. Uh, in fact, one has to squelch. If there's any squelching going on, uh, it's not by the Pope right now. Uh, uh, and his minions. It's, uh, it's, it's being done by the, the, the notion that knowledge is best pursued, and particularly the knowledge pursued within the institutions of higher education are pursued when we bracket theological considerations uh, and, and bracket uh, the, what theological prejudices. Uh, this is the conventional understanding of the nature of reason and the role of scholarship. Reason is neutral, but, but to be neutral means it, it has to uh, remain indifferent to, to theological claims. Uh, to reason well about anything, one must resist accepting any kind of a priori assumptions from religion and from alleged sources of revelation. Religion must be methodologically atheist or agnostic. Did I say reason? Reason must be methodologically atheist or agnostic. It must assume that things are understandable whether it be history or physics or economics or whatever. Things are understandable and best explainable without any kind of necessary relationship to God. That, when, that, 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 God's, that the reality of God is extrinsic to all created realities and the university is charged with studying these created realities and they are perfectly understandable without relation to God. If you want to bring in a religious perspective, uh, that's fine, we'll allow that <clears throat> under certain restrictions, but don't, ass don't assume that the essence of the thing requires asserting that God was somehow involved. Now, it should be obvious that that standpoint is not theologically neutral. And yet, it is widely considered uh, by many of our best educated contemporaries in not only in higher education, but in politics and in, and in uh, journalism, that, uh, that r religion or religious convictions, religious claims, religious uh, presuppositions, are extrinsic to uh, the kind of work that scholars do. Uh, David, uh, David C. Schindler, theologian, has said to insist on the neutrality of reason means to affirm that reason is not by its very nature ordered to God. And here he's not just saying that the things we study can be, we can safely bracket the question of God from the from the relationship of things we study, but reason itself, the, the capacity that we have to reason is, in a sense, neutral, atheist. It's, it's, it doesn't have anything to do with God. Uh, now that, that is not what was assumed about reason. Uh, I remember the first time I saw the title to uh, Alistair McIntyre's book, Whose Justice with Which Rationality, and I have to confess I was a little befuddled by it, I thought, well, what do you mean, whose rationality? I can understand that there might be different uh, sets of assumptions about the nature of justice, but 
rationality is rationality. Reason is reason. Everybody has the same idea of reason. It's just there. It's like saying, who's gravity? I mean, of course, gravity works the way gravity works. Doesn't matter if you're uh, Persian or, uh, or Hindu or whatever. But it turns out that reason is not that kind of thing. That reason, there are different accounts of what reason is and how reason works. It doesn't mean that they're all equally false or equally true. It just means that there, there are different accounts of reason. And what we today assume to be real reason, which produces real knowledge, which is taught at real universities, uh, is really the product of, of enlightenment ideas. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more um, about the, the history of that um, at the risk of having a history lesson <laughs> that's a little bit dense. The, uh, there were two professors from Duke who uh, called attention to this episode uh, with the new president and her concern about erudition and religion. And uh, they wrote an essay where they looked at the fracture between erudition and religion and point out that for, for most of Western history, there was no division between spirituality and academic life. Uh, that the life of the mind uh, was seen as, as a single uh, and yet multifaceted endeavor of serving God through intellectual inquiry. It was an endeavor that was intrinsically spiritual because it was carried on in the context of a complex web of Christian belief and practice, and because when it was properly carried out, it prepared one for beholding the mysteries of God. As a book uh, came out, I don't know, seven or eight years ago called The Logic of the Heart by James Peters, teaches philosophy at, uh, I think he t teaches at uh, Swanee. And uh, Peters observes at the beginning of the book that our conception of rationality, of how reason works, of what reason does, of what reason is for, our conception of rationality cannot be separated from our metaphysics, that is, from our understanding of the nature of the world and of the human self. Every conception of reason has behind it a conception of the place of human being in the universe. So if you believe that human beings are material coagulations, uh, the effect of, of time and chance, uh, what you think reason will be uh, will be dictated by that. Um, evolutionary biologists, and I guess there are evolutionary epistemologists who, uh, who would uh, understand our capacity for reasoning as part of our uh, pursuit of survival. That, we, uh, that for our species and to survive, uh, we cultivated certain capacities um, and, and, uh, and that, 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 that that's all it reflects. The, the idea that it might reflect a connection with the transcendent doesn't appear because that doesn't appear on, the, on their metaphysical horizon. So it turns out that to, to, to exclude religious claims from the pursuit of reason, it's a kind of a, a circular claim. We, We've decided for what are essentially theological reasons what reason is, and then we'll exclude theology from the work of reasoning in, in public institutions. There are, I, I suggest in the first talk that uh, I'm a little nervous about separating the institutions committed to the intellectual life and the spiritual life. And there are all sorts of dualisms and fracturings that occur uh, in modern culture that, that I think part of the church's task at this moment is to restore uh, what had been driven asunder and to put, put back together what God had, had joined together originally. And there are lots of ways we can look at these different dualisms. Uh, we talked about reason and faith. We could talk uh, also about uh, nature and grace or nature and supernature that there's a tendency to assume that they are kind of, uh, that it's a zero-sum game. Something is either a product of nature or it's a product of grace, but the idea that they could be uh, co-inhabiting and, and, and co-influencing uh, isn't on the radar. Uh, creation and redemption are kept separate. Law and freedom. Uh, se the, uh, politically, the secular and the religious. To be a religious institution or a secular institution. 
That, that again, presupposes a kind of dualism uh, that, 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 uh, that is really a, a modern invention, uh, the, the, the separation of those things. Uh, Peters, in, in his book, uh, Logic of the Heart, talks about the modern separation of the sacred and the secular. And he, I'll have to, you'll have to forgive me a, a short philosophy lesson here, but it's, uh, we, we can't get through this without examining some of the history of how we got here. And so I'm going to have to talk, use some big words to talk about, about realism and nominalism, because I really do think that, that, that these late medieval philosophical disputes that, uh, that most of us aren't even aware of happened uh, actually help us explain a lot of the kind of cultural confusion that we're in the midst of now. Our ability to separate, let, let me say uh, just a quick uh, anecdote before diving into this. Um, I, I've interviewed now a couple times a theologian named uh, Bill Cavanaugh, and uh, Bill has written very compellingly about the invention of the modern idea of, of religion. Uh, if you ask people what a religion is, uh, they will usually de describe it in terms of a body of beliefs or talk about it uh, often in very personal terms and very, uh, uh, they might talk about religious practices, but religion will be separated from other spheres of life. It's separated from economics, it's separated from politics, separated from, from other, other, uh, other public spheres. And it's, and it's essentially a private sphere. It's a private sphere that has to do with a spiritual life and not with public things that happen in history. And, um, so, and, and part of the point Kavanaugh has made, and he's among many scholars who pointed out that this is a really novel understanding. This is a novel, and it's, it's a, a very parochial Western understanding of what religion is. Uh, we talked about how religion might have been defined in earlier cultures. So for instance, uh, he brought up the question of the Aztecs and human sacrifice. If you'd asked, someone performing one of these sacrifices, is this a religious act or a political act? Because it's clearly happening within the context of securing the, the, a public good of some kind uh, through the favor of the gods. Uh, if you'd asked, is it a religious act or a, a political act, they would have not had any idea what, what you were talking about. M my daughter, who uh, studied medieval and renaissance studies at William and Mary and did a lot of study of classical culture, also told me a story. We were talking about this matter one night at the dinner table. She told me a story about some episode in which one of the Caesars had returned from a triumphant campaign and was in a procession uh, uh, th through Rome, and the, the wheel fell off of a chariot in the middle of this great victorious procession. Now, this was an ill omen. And so Caesar gets off the chariot and goes to one of the nearby temples, I don't know which god was honored in the temple, and proceeds up the steps of the temple on his knees in order to make amends to the god that people thought had been offended. And the question is, was this a political act? It's Caesar. Or is this a religious act? Is a temple? Well, yes, <laughs> it was both. There was no separation of religion and politics. Uh, during this conversation, Bill Kavanaugh says to me, uh, you know, the really interesting question for us now is not what caused the politicization of Islam, but what caused the religionization of Christianity. Uh, since 9-11, a lot of people are worried about politicized religion. And look how dangerous religion is when it gets politicized. But that begs the question as to whether or not religion was imaginable as, have, as being without political consequences prior to the modern age. Now, of course, many people will say, well, that's why we're more progressive than, than, uh, than much of Islam, because we have figured out how to separate th these two realms. We've figured out how to keep the, separate, the sacred and the secular apart. And, uh, and Muslims just need to learn that lesson. Uh, well, is that theologically, is that division 
in fact, theologically something that Christians really want to affirm uh, as decisively. It, it's odd that often the same people who complain about living in a secularized country in America where religion has no public consequences will then say uh, that Islam allows for too many public consequences. So th sometimes people think, well, the question is we just have to figure out how to negotiate and how to, how to balance things. But what is often not asked by Christians or non-believers in this is whether or not we can intelligibly with theological uh, care and with theological responsibility uh, draw a neat line and, 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 and create a wall between these two things. One thing that's clear, however we divide religion from politics or religion from public life, it's ultimately a theological question. Uh, it's that Christian people shouldn't, shouldn't answer politically uh, before they answer it theologically. Because ultimately the relationship between God and any aspect of human life or culture is a theological question. It's, 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 uh, and it's, 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 it's fascinating to me to see people who think that we can answer it in terms of constitutional law or we can answer it in terms of political philosophy and not even ask questions in terms of, of, of theology. It shows how secularized uh, our imaginations have become. Let me read a passage from, from Peters as he's trying to explain how we got here. The modern separation of the sacred from the secular may well have its origins in the worldview of the late medieval nominalists who rejected essences. They rejected the idea of transcendent essences in creation. They reduced the natural order to a realm of valueless, formless individuals. They thereby formed an unbridgeable divide between the truths of reason and the truths of faith. This pre-modern demarcation of the secular from the sacred was reinforced by a number of early modern philosophers, and he goes on and lists these modern philosophers, who wanted to move away from what they saw as an antiquated conception of nature as teleological. That is, nature has a purpose. Nature has an end. Everything that's created is created for some purpose. That was both an Aristotelian and a Christian understanding. They wanted to move toward a framework in which nature was understood as an objective, mechanized, and valueless natural order. Creation, well, we call it nature now. Nature is just, a, it's, it's valueless, it's mechanized, it's understood in terms of mathematics and physics. It doesn't have any inherent meaning. We can ascribe meaning to it after the fact. And if you're a Buddhist, you ascribe Buddhist meaning to it. If you're a Christian, you ascribe Christian meaning to it. You can read whatever you want to because it's just nature itself is a blank slate. Nature is inherently meaningless. Uh, and any religious reading of nature is an extrinsic reading. It's reading something that's alien to the thing itself. It's from outside. Because, and this is a complicated story, which I won't try to summarize, because I barely understand it myself. Uh, th this, this, this notion happens in part because of new understandings of the relationship between God and creation itself. Whereas for most of Christian history, people believed that they, they had a, a set of beliefs tied to what is alluded to when St. Paul affirms the pagan poet on Mars Hill, he says, in, in him we live and move and have our being. That the, that the, that the imminence of God, that, that, that God is, is, is present to all of reality. And that God is not just the originator of things, it's in some kind of deist moment of creation that he walks away from and then eliminates, but God is present and sustains and holds together all things now. That's made clear in those three New Testament passages I read. Everything's being held together. Everything has its coherence in Christ really now. That the doctrine of creation isn't just about what happened, but the doctrine of creation is about God's relationship to creation and his upholding of creation and his, uh, his connections with creation and all aspects of creation all the time. 
Now that's, that's the reality that is there and it can't be understood. You can abstract its meaning and essence and you can look at it as a set of mechanisms and you can do cool things. Uh, you, you can gain power over nature if you, uh, and, and you can gain power to do whatever you want because you won't have any restrictions to what you want to do based on what the thing is uh, because the thing has no inherent nature. So the, our, our modern idea of the separation of the sec sacred and the secular and I think our ideas about or some of the intuitions we have about the separation of faith and reason are really a product of this ultimate metaphysical separation of God from creation whereby God is an alien absence not a, an animating presence in creation. Now this, this change is a change that happens in Christian theology. So there's a wonderful new book by Michael Allen Gillespie called The Theological Origins of Modernity in which he argues that a lot of our confusion and a lot of the problems that religious people complain about under the heading of secularization, well, it was theologians who, who ushered us into this stark uh, new world, theologians who reconfigured uh, the understanding of the relationship between God and creation for reasons that I won't go into now. The question that is facing a lot of theologians now is, was that a good decision? First of all, given the cultural results that we see, uh, given the kind of confusion and the kind of nihilism that informs much of Western culture, the inability to have any kind of rational discussion about the nature of reality because it's assumed reality has no rationality to it. Uh, uh, that, that, if that's one of the results of this redefinition of the relationship between God and creation, maybe we made a mistake. Maybe, maybe those theologians were mistaken. Theologians have made mistakes in the past, so this might be one of them. And it, it, it's fascinating to me, again, I'm not a scholar, uh, and I get to, I get to um, without any kind of responsibility, dabble in all sorts of disciplines that are none of my business, without a license. Uh, and I get to talk to these people and read their books and ask them questions, and they get to explain why I've misunderstood what they've said. <clears throat> but it's fascinating to me to see that across many disciplines, in philosophy, and theology, cultural studies, history, uh, there's, there has been for some time, 20, 30, 40 years, maybe longer, a, a re-examining of those original dualistic roots uh, so as to uh, reopen the question of, well, maybe, maybe, maybe the modern West, Maybe the problem with a privatized, inert Christianity is because the modern West took a, uh, a bad turn uh, a long time ago. This isn't just a product of the 60s. It's maybe the 1260s, uh, but not the 1960s. Now, the, uh, I'm going to come back to this. Uh, I, I think this is really, really important to the task of Christian scholars. Because I think that you can, you can do you can do scholarship as defined by the terms of the modern secular academy and you, could, you can do some nice things and you can do some useful things. But uh, I think there's going to be less and less room for, uh, for any kind of theologically informed scholarship to be present uh, in, in the academy. Uh, I may be wrong in that, but uh, but why would we want to? Why would we want to f sail under just a few sails? I mean, if we really want to think about politics or economics or art or history as well as we can, wouldn't it be best that we understand the full reality of the things that we're studying? If we want to study human psychology, we want to understand social history. Wouldn't it be best that we have an understanding of the meaning of the human that is as rich and, and developed and unfettered 
as possible. Why would we want anything less? Uh, why would Christian scholars want anything less? Well, tenure might be one, <laughs> one reason I understand. <laughs> Feeding the kids. Uh, but I think, again, I'm, I'm not giving a practical, I'm not saying this is a practical trajectory, but I think that uh, the kinds of conflicts that I hear, that I hear most, more from graduate students than from faculty members who are wrestling with how to navigate their way through graduate school and then how to get a tenured position. The institution is, uh, the, the, the institution of modern Western higher education as I think the institution of modern Western politics and government uh, is, uh, has, has, it's not theologically neutral. It's made theological decisions that are questionable. Uh, we can try to work within that system as much as possible. But I think we always ought to recognize that the system is, is flawed in, in, this, in this very substantive way. That, that, that it, it insists on sustaining uh, a division that really shouldn't be there. What time are we supposed to quit? Five. And I'm at 15 after now. Let me, let me do one more thing. Uh, some of you may know Charles Taylor's book, A Secular Age, that has gotten a lot of attention. And Taylor deals with some of these ideas. And another scholar who's dealt with a lot of these ideas is, is John Milbank. And uh, I mentioned Bill Kavanaugh and a number of others. And, and part of what these scholars, they're looking back at the, at the, at the, at the history of the, the rise of the idea of the secular. John Milbank's book, uh, Theology and Social Theory, starts with the sentence, once there was no secular. Once there was no secular. What, what Milbank has tried to argue, he's tried to do a work in revisionist history, what we tend to assume is that, that Christendom was irrepressibly religious and, and uh, religion permeated every aspect of life. And uh, then Galileo showed up, uh, or you know, pick your hero. Uh, modern science emerges, which, which gives us the capacity to understand things without reference to uh, Bacon. Uh, Bacon would be a good hero. G gives us. Uh, capacity, or we think, a capacity to understand things and, and control things without any kind of reference to, to final causes or without any kind of reference to God. Uh, and gradually people thought, hey, we could get along without those religious draperies perfectly well. And gradually all of these unnecessary, uh, all this unnecessary drapery of religion fell away. And what was left was the pure secular reality that was there, whether it be secular society or secular reason or secular nature, nature understandable without any kind of reference to God. So there, there was this, this core pristine reality that was always there, but it was, it was covered over by all of these interfering uh, layers of interpretation and and, but there was, there was some core neutral thing, a neutral thing that was there that we just needed time for those things to fall away. And we're still seeing the falling away. Marriage, well, we, it, it has some draperies surrounding it. We wanna, we wanna see its definition emerge with a kind of purity that's not contaminated by all these kind of religious claims. Well, what Milbank and Taylor and others say that this, this, is, this, is the revision, this, is the, this is the story the winners want to tell of what happened in, in some way. Uh, but in fact, there was no idea of a secular. There was no such thing as pure nature. There was no such thing as unaided reason or uh, uh, reason alone. That this, th these things were invented. That this, and this is the main point that, that, uh, that Milbank makes, that, that, the, that the, the secular had to be invented first as a kind of intellectual experiment, uh, and then it became a kind of concrete reality as people began to try to realize the thing. But in fact, there is, there, uh, it wasn't that the draperies fell away to reveal 
the pure thing underneath it. It's that, in fact, a new thing was crafted, and the new thing that was crafted was as much a product of philosophical and theological bias as, as the old thing, in a sense. It, 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 this is not a kind of a, a neutral reality that emerges and we have this aha moment. We say we can now see it. Uh, now, again, this is, uh, I, we do need to take a break and we'll, and we'll come back to this and I'm sure you have questions and I will try to answer, answer this. Um, the secular is not a neutral, dispassionate, or objective view of ourselves in the world. It had to be created as a positive ideology. And the secular view holds its own assumptions and prejudices concerning human society and nature, which are no more objective or justifiable than those of ancient medieval philosophers and theologians. This is the, very much the case in institutions, secular institutions of, of higher learning. Now, I, the short answer to the question of why, why the university needs a church is because uh, the, the church understands reality and understands the logos sustained nature of reality uh, in ways better than the university does. And that the, the, the university, in, if the university is about the pursuit of truth and about the pursuit of knowledge and the and knowledge of, of reality, then there are aspects of that reality that are essential to comprehending the reality that the university needs to be reminded of. There was a time when the university didn't mind being reminded of that by the church, but we're not in one of those times now. And for a variety of reasons. Uh, sorry to keep say, saying that. Uh, so now that's a very confrontational, and, and, and I'm going to get more confrontational as we go along, because I don't think, uh, if, if in fact the the complaints that are uttered about the state of the university by many of its secular critics, and they are legion. I have lots of books on my shelves by non-theological sources, like Bill Redding's book, The, the University in Ruins, uh, <laughs> a winsome title. Uh, and I, you know, I, I stopped getting the Chronicle of Higher Education because I got so tired of reading this. And, and you know, almost every book that comes out about the humanities about every other year, it's about well, uh, you know, what was it, uh, Frank Donahue's book, The Last Professor, you know, it's this wistful view of, oh, you know, we lost. Uh, so there's a, there's a great sense that something is broken, something's been lost in the university, that it cannot pursue its original vocation. Well, I think it cannot pursue its original vocation because of the fact that it has bought into the idea that, that Piety and learning are separable, that, that, that reason has to be uh, entirely uh, cut off from, from revelation. In other words, that reality is perfectly understandable without any kind of reference to God. That's not uh, an understanding that Christians can assent to, and even, I think, for provisional reasons. So I will stop there finally. And we're doing Q&A till when? Uh, okay, yeah, I'm sorry to go on. Yeah, I haven't seen that book. <clears throat> uh, so I, 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 in fact, I think my copy just came yesterday in the mail. Um, I, I, uh, I, 
Well, I've followed Oz's work for years, and I, particularly when he was going to Williamsburg Charter Project, which was on religious freedom. And uh, I think Oz, uh, well, to be very blunt, you know, I almost died from a heart attack two and a half years ago. And I, someone said, my, my new motto is, uh, I should be dead, I'm going to be damned. Uh, I, I, I think that, I think that uh, it is uh, that we're trying to recover an 18th century balance is, is, not, is not a long-term solution. Uh, and, and again, there are a lot of, it, it's interesting to me, um, th there's a lot of really interesting work being done in what's called political theology. And uh, people on left and right. So Oliver O'Donovan, who recently retired from Edinburgh, was really that moral, moral professor of moral theology at uh, Regis Professor of moral, moral Philosophy at, at Oxford. Uh, some really remarkable work on deeply theologically informed political theory. Uh, O'Donovan himself says you have to go back to Richard Hooker to find, uh, basically, beginning in the 18th century, Christian. Uh, Christians thinking about politics secularized their discipline. They began to believe that, that we can do this discipline without reference to redemptive history, uh, without reference to the question of whether or not, uh, of, 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 of the differing ways in which providence is mediated given where we are in redemptive history. So the fact that uh, the mediation of institutions of justice prior to Christ's coming and after Christ's coming might be different in some way. That, that the effect of the incarnation, that, that, that truth itself taking human flesh has historical consequences and will transform politics. That there's some eschatological reality that should be taken into consideration as we think about politics. For the most part, uh, O'Donovan has long been lamenting the fact that that political thought by Christians has largely abandoned uh, a dynamic theological, uh, a dynamic theological uh, edge to it. It's not saying it's entirely without theology, but the, what what typically happens is uh, we we distill Christian teaching to a body of of principles political principles, and we try to say, okay, let's try to enact those, those political principles. Uh, it tends to be very odd historical. So again, political principles prior to Christ's coming and political principles after the resurrection and ascension are pretty much the same because they're, they're constant, they're natural laws. Uh, uh, those political principles also tend to ignore the, the, the place of the church as the political institution. In, in the life of a society. Church is considered a private institution, not an institution. Now those are, those are, whether or not we should do that, there are a lot of people doing political theology now they are saying, you know, we have self-secularized, we have self-domesticated uh, theology and, uh, and uh, thinking about politics. So I think that, uh, now uh, I have a lot of friends that have lived inside the Beltway for a while I have a lot of friends interested in politics. And what I find interesting and somewhat dismaying is that they continue to write their books and essays about public policy and Christians in the public square and all those sorts of things without any reference at all to this incredibly rich work that's been going on for 20, 30, 40 years, raising fundamental questions about whether or not the modern, secular, liberal state is actually uh, theologically, a theologically sound expression of, of a Christian understanding of what politics should be. Uh, so there are, there's wonderful work being done, but it, it, it's, 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 first of all, it's not influencing people who tend to write about public policy, and, and Oz has kind of been doing that for a long time. Secondly, it's not even influencing other Christians who are going to work in political theory. I have friends who do work in political philosophy who are entirely unaware. Again, this is part of the specialization of the academy. They're entirely unaware of, 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 of the theological work that's been done uh, challenging the uh, kind of conventional status quo that we've inherited.
area. So I think that, uh, obviously, some of it is going to take time for that to happen. Part of it is, is going to take time because there's a lot of institutional momentum which is sustaining attention to some things uh, and not others. It's a lot easier to get funding and sell books if you have prescriptions for how we can work within the existing system, rather than to write a book to say that the existing system is so flawed that we need to consider an entirely different People don't buy those books, so <laughs> that's another very practical thing. We're going to try to get two, yeah, more, I'm sorry. two more questions. Okay. Um, I know you were, you were kind of half, half joking maybe about the just feeding your children and, and tenure. Um, but I think for, for maybe for many of us, I, I know for myself, it's not even so much a conscious thing. Sure. It's sort of the air that we breathe. Sure. Um, and we're just trying to get along sure. with the system we find ourselves in. Um, but I wondered, um, I really appreciate your comments. I wondered if you had any more thoughts specifically on how we can be more aware of that. And for those of us who, who teach, um, you know, how can we kind of right. ignite that in yeah. the students? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and let me say, I, uh, I'm profoundly idealistic, so that's <laughs> my wife often complains about this. Uh, but I think, I, I think that. If, in fact, the, the, the status quo that we have in terms of our understanding of relationship between faith, religion, culture, all those things, if it's, if it's unreal, it's going to fall apart. It will fall apart sometime, maybe not my lifetime, maybe for your children's lifetime, or my grandchildren's lifetime. It will fall apart, and it may go with, not with a bang, but with a, was it whisper or with a whisper? Uh, and so our children and our children's children and their children are going to need to have some idea of how they could wisely reconstruct alternative forms of order. So one of the reasons I think this kind of reflection needs to happen is so that we can figure out how to do it better next time. Uh, and also, I think it enables us to see uh, um, when we come into conflict, we can see that the conflicts are actually structurally uh, caused, and they're not just because we have some nasty people conspiring against us. Uh, it, it kind of relieves us of conspiracy theories or paranoia or to, to realize that, you know, it's not just these nasty progressive people who are trying to, 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 to kill Christmas. <laughs> uh, it's actually the product of these long systemic mis- Alignments that we need to work. And again, I think so. And I think I, I think that uh, there again there are tons of material being written uh, in, in, across disciplinary lines that are again you could say in a sense this is part of what post postmodern it, 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 it's, it's a rejection of a modern framework um, and it's a it's a recovery of of insights and perspectives that were lost or eclipsed because of modernity preoccupation. Uh, and th there, I would say, if I was teaching, I don't know, if I was teaching political science, for instance, or economics, I'd really want to be immersed in the work of these people, uh, partly to find things that they may not have seen and to realize there might be problems there. Uh, and I think it's, it, it would be possible to have conversations with across this planet. One thing I've long desired to see, some of the scholars who do this work are in Christian institutions and have the freedom to fly with all sail, okay? Or to sail with all sail. Um, and I would, occasionally I see interaction between people who teach at large research universities and who are muzzled to some extent, and people who have a lot more freedom to think in terms of Trinitarian theology when they think about political philosophy. Those people ought to be talking to each other more. And, and it, it would, I don't think it would be hard to have them in the same room. Uh, so to, to pursue those kinds of opportunities for conversation, as well as reading the book, is, is wonderful.
criticize Christians from ignoring the exercise of intellectual life and reason, not necessarily as defined by the dominant conventional institution that governs us. So I was, in fact, I would say that if in fact, during the period that Mark Knoll described in the 19th century, the Christians had been more deliberate in attending to intellectual life, it's possible that the dominant assumptions in those now confused institutions may not have become as dominant because Christians might have been leavening lock with Augustine more. Uh, but I think that uh, because, or in the case of political thought, um, uh, why weren't there more political theorists in the late 19th and 20th century Christian political theorists who were engaged with Aquinas and Augustine and Hooker? And, uh, you know, there's a huge tradition Oliver Donald has documented uh, of, of Christians thinking about politics that just fell off the radar. At a certain point, Locke had the final word and we just not, we're just going to ignore it. So I'd say, uh, I, I, yeah, I thought about introducing that earlier and saying that, yeah, we want to, the life of the mind is very uh, significant for the church, but not the life of the mind as it is, as it is, as it is proscribed and circumscribed by uh, modern institutions that claim to have, have a monopoly on defining the life. So I'd say, uh, and that's why, and I would also say that the reason why this conversation between church and university is so essential, that, that people in the church, clergy and teachers in the church, need to be uh, encouraged <laughs> to abandon the tendency to cultivate these wonderful systems of hermetically sealed theology and devotional work, which have nothing to do with politics or economics or art or uh, epistemology, uh, and, and, uh, and actually realize that if, if, if those Christocentric creation passages are true, then, then Christian understanding of reality and of God has consequences for every sphere of life, and that's part of the church's task is to explore that. Uh, and to encourage, not, not definitively, but to, to call those who have an intellectual vocation to attend as, as thoroughly to, to those dimensions of their work as they, as they might to a kind of secular alternative. So that preaching about the Trinity, or preaching about the resurrection, or preaching about the ascension, or preaching about eschatology should open up avenues for exploration for intellectual life in all sorts of situations, not in a moralistic and kind of a, uh, gratuitous way, but, but in a really simple way. And I think that, I think that would be possible. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for these uh, really good questions.